Okay. Right. Thank you for coming today to the Spark seminar. We have uh, two speakers from the University of Sheffield and uh, Dr. Hor uh, Mohsen Shafizaden is going to introduce them. I'm going to sit down and leave uh, Mohsen to do the introductions and then we'll have the presentations. Following the presentations, we're going to have questions and answers. Thank you. Mohsen. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Temis. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, very, very uh, excited to uh, present uh, the works of two of our colleagues from the University of Sheffield, my colleagues in different departments uh, around healthy aging and healthy brain from neuroscience to computer science. So that, that is the, the very uh, novel, uh, actually, the subject for many researchers to understand how we can maintain our uh, brain functions healthy and also uh, try to uh, do a healthy lifestyle when we get older. Can we go to the next slide, please, Temis? And uh, if you play this uh, video, yeah, this is about the brain and neurons. That is the communication in nerves. We are interested to know how we actually think, how we act, how we behave. And that is exactly the communication you can see between nerves. And this is very active function, active process, but as you can see in the right side, this complexity between the nerves and the functions declining because of the aging. And that is based on the biological complexity theory. And we are interested to now, can we slightly prevent this process and still keep the complexity of our brain and the body as young as we can? And that is exactly the scope of this presentation. First, understanding what is the brain and how we can measure brain complexity and brain function. And the second one is about how we can use computer science to slightly implement the brain function and make it easier for a human to interact with the real world. Next slide, please. Okay, our uh, first presenter is Dr. Miles Jones from Department of Psychology. Miles is uh, actually expert in uh, brain imaging by MRI, scanning and EEG, that is electroencephalography techniques. And he works with uh, cognitive scientists and also neuroscientists to understand the origin of the disease from childhood to uh, actually adulthood. And Miles uh, has experience in terms of researcher to contribute to different grants and also many uh, scholar activities. Our second presenter and a speaker today is Dr. Mahnaz Arwane. And she's an uh, expert in machine learning and uh, biomedical engineering and very, uh, very good in terms of using the computer science to interact with the technology like EEG and also robotic systems and had some kind of the grant uh, contribution in biomechanic groups and machine learning and computer scientists at Sheffield Hollow University and in other institutes. May I invite Dr. Jones to start the first presentation, please? Hi there, so uh, thanks for the uh, invite to uh, speak to you today. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, how uh, changes in brain waves uh, might occur when we uh, age. So to understand uh, brain waves, uh, the first thing to understand is how they're usually measured. Uh, how we can do that in uh, awake behaving and sometimes sleepy uh, human subjects 
uh, is with EEG or the electroencephalogram. Uh, so in an EEG setup, if you're not, uh, no, is so in an EEG uh, uh, setup, uh, if you've not uh, seen one before, uh, there's a cap uh, that goes on the subject's head, and then electrodes play through holes in the cap, and the electrodes have a distinct uh, spatial location on the head, uh, and the electrodes can record uh, voltage changes on the scalp. Uh, the mass action of neurons, which is typically an excitatory post-synaptic potentials, uh, produces voltage changes in the brain. Uh, these spread via volume conductance, gallop and cancel out, and make their way onto the scalp. And we can record some uh, surrogates of the uh, internal brain activity uh, on the scalp. So what does EEG data uh, look like? Then this is uh, actually a raw uh, EEG data in uh, MATLAB. Uh, this is uh, a previous PhD student, uh, Ali, and he has some very prominent uh, brain uh, oscillations that people used to like to uh, test their uh, studies on him for uh, pilot work. So if you've got time uh, along the x-axis, uh, each of these is one of the electrodes on the scalp, and you can see uh, just by eye without doing any uh, fancy analysis, we can see some brain waves or oscillatory behavior uh, in the signals we can record uh, from uh, someone's uh, scalp. As you're a sports scientist, you might not be used to thinking uh, about waveforms and uh, frequencies. Uh, so just a reminder uh, that a waveform uh, in the purest sinusoidal form has uh, peaks uh, and troughs. Uh, a cycle of a wave is from a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough. And the uh, frequency uh, of the wave uh, is how many times these cycles uh, occur. So we usually measure frequency in uh, hertz, which is how many times per second uh, these uh, waveforms occur. We've also got the amplitude of the oscillations, which would be the height uh, of the peak uh, to the uh, trough. Um, uh, the least abstract thing you can think of that uh, has frequencies it is sound, uh, sound waves. So in the case of sound waves, uh, a low frequency draw it is a low pitch and a high frequency oh. <coughs> voice, uh, is a uh, high uh, pitch. And as you can see, uh, there's waveforms of different uh, frequencies, different uh, cycles per second inherent in the uh, EEG uh, signal. Some we can see by uh, eye, uh, some we can extract uh, with signal processing techniques that uh, filter the uh, data into uh, different frequencies. Uh, these uh, frequencies uh, were seen uh, all the way back in the first EEG studies in the late 20s and early 30s by Hans Berger. Uh, there's different EEG frequency bands uh, that are given Greek letters. Uh, <coughs> there's some really slow frequencies of delta waves, um, less than three times a second, all the way up to the uh, gamma waves. Uh, these different frequency bands were behaved, defined behaviorally by Hans Berger and uh, were present in different stages of wakefulness and uh, sleepiness. So in general terms, the slower waves uh, are more prevalent in slow wave sleep when you're uh, sleeping. Uh, faster ones might be when you're uh, active uh, and awake. Uh, and then some more intermediate ones uh, if you're relaxed with your eyes closed. What we're interested in today though is the highest uh, frequency waves, which are termed uh, gamma waves. The highest frequency waves you can see with EEG. Uh, with the electrodes placed on the scalp are gamma oscillations, which are anything from uh, anything above 30 or 50 hertz, uh, right the way up to what the highest frequency you can measure with the EGR, which might be about 120, uh, 130 hertz. And we're particularly uh, interested in those, as they're associated with higher cognitive functions and connectivity between brain regions, uh, and might be associated with problem solving and uh, concentration. So we can see EEG uh, waves uh, at rest uh, and do some analysis to uh, see them. So we can see just by eye, here's some uh, alpha waves uh, going about eight times uh, a second. Uh, but we can also uh, see <coughs> uh, changes in these brain waves when we present uh, stimuli or pass to the uh, subject. So presenting us, if we're interested in brain waves per se, 
Uh, we can give uh, a simple visual stimulus. This evokes changes in the brain waves, makes them a bit easier to see than the ones that are just sort of tickling along uh, when we're at uh, rest. So if we present a visual stimulus uh, to a, a, a subject, where we might be like this uh, a flashing uh, checkerboard, uh, we can see activity at the back of the brain. If you're not a neuroscientist, is where your uh, primary visual areas are. And then we can analyze the data. This is time along the x axis at different frequencies, different cycles per second along the y axis. And the colors are at changes in magnitude of the waves. When we present a visual stimulus, we get increases uh, in uh, different uh, frequency bands uh, like alpha and theta. You can see a decrease in the slower. Uh, sleepy waves shown in blue. And uh, what we're interested in today is these higher uh, frequency oscillations called uh, gamma uh, oscillations. And so you can see the visual stimulus uh, evokes this prolonged increases in uh, gamma activity. So what's interesting uh, about uh, gamma oscillations is they can occur at different uh, peak frequencies. You can see that some of the uh, EEG waves have got quite a narrow frequency band, alpha is between 8 and 13, but the gamma oscillation is anything uh, that we can measure that's above 30 or uh, 50 hertz. So there's quite a wide uh, range of frequencies that can be classified as gamma. And as such, um, uh, they have uh, different uh, peak frequencies uh, in different people. So here we've got these uh, wavelet transforms, they're called. You don't really need to know about that. Uh, to look at changes in frequency over time. We've got time along the uh, x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, uh, changes in magnitude with the colour. And uh, this person here has got a sort of middle, uh, middling uh, gamma frequency uh, of about 55 uh, hertz. This person's got a higher uh, gamma frequency of about uh, 70, 75 uh, hertz. So they vary uh, across people. Um, and what we're going to be talk about today is changes with uh, age. So I haven't done much uh, work on ageing uh, per se. Uh, a lot of the work we do in the psychology department is about neurodevelopmental conditions like uh, autism or uh, psychiatric diagnoses uh, like schizophrenia. But we also look at how the data uh, changes with age. An interesting thing about the gamma oscillation is the peak frequency that you oscillate that or use that uh, decreases with age. So this is just some data we uh, took where we measured the peak gamma frequency uh, listed by visual uh, stimuli uh, for another study which we'll talk about shortly. And we reanalyzed this in terms of the age and you can see a reasonable correlation between the uh, peak gamma frequency as aging increases. So as age increases, uh, the peak gamma frequency decreases. You can see there's a high degree of variability across people. There's still a reasonable correlation and decrease in the peak gamma frequency as we age. This just happened to be a, a study we were conducting about uh, neurostimulation. This was just the age range we happened to get when we you know, tried to get participants uh, from our university volunteers list. And so we've got people as, uh, in their early 50s uh, and then a lot of about, you know, 18 year olds uh, students, uh, and we saw, but we still saw this decrease in gamma frequency. Researchers who were <coughs> um, uh, more interested in aging per se have done this study across a much wider age range, uh, going up into the uh, early 80s, uh, and again they see a reasonable correlation uh, between the peak gamma frequency and <coughs> um, uh, and age uh, within that the gamma frequency decreases with uh, age. Uh, what does this uh, mean then? Well, uh, the thing about different uh, neuronal oscillations is uh, you can link them uh, to all sorts of things. Uh, you think uh, psychology uh, and uh, neuroscience, neuroscience is a good of science, it's a good way of stopping you talking rubbish about psychology, but no, when you've got neuroscience actually allows you to talk even more nonsense. So you can make up that uh, these oscillations are due to all sorts of things. And you end up with this sort of spectral uh, chronology that the gamma might be concentration and binding of perception and alpha might be uh, you know, a way of encoding memories in time and all sorts of things. 
In fact, we've got much, the cool thing about Gamma is we've got some much more uh, concrete uh, underpinnings. Uh, and that is that it's related to the amount of uh, neuronal uh, inhibition. So in the brain, uh, the principal uh, excitatory neurotransmitter is um, uh, glutamate and the uh, principal uh, uh, inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter is um, GABA. And uh, there's uh, a balance of the excitation and inhibition in the brain. Uh, and the most famous condition when the balance of inhibition and excitation uh, goes wrong uh, is epilepsy. Uh, and that's why you have uh, epileptic seizures to get too much excitation uh, and not enough uh, inhibition. Uh, the excitatory neurons <laughs> in the cortex, which are long apical dendrites that go uh, up and down the cortex, and uh, the gabaergic in inhibitory neurons, particularly interneurons, that connect uh, these uh, neurons together and sort of provide a dampening of the neuronal activity and excitation uh, that occurs. So the neurons fire, they fire asynchronously, have a little pitter patter, and that's what gives rise to these high frequency damp oscillations. And the degree of GABAergic inhibitory tone that you get in these interneurons connecting them together is what determines your uh, gamma uh, frequency. So your gamma frequency is related to the amount of uh, neuronal uh, inhibition uh, you have uh, in the cortex. Uh, and people have measured this uh, directly uh, with advanced uh, uh, medical, um, um, medical physics, uh, MRI te techniques, uh, and shown uh, that the uh, amount of GABA is related to your uh, gamma frequencies. The gamma frequency is related to neural inhibition. We can see that uh, directly. What does this mean for cognition? As I said, we can link uh, oscillations in either the manners of different aspects of uh, cognition. Uh, but the gamma frequency, and therefore the amount of inhibition, is related to the performance of uh, some uh, basic uh, cognitive tasks. So if we get some sort of really basic perceptual tasks, uh, like a visual orientation discrimination paradigm, we can show people a grating at 45 degrees. Uh, then there's a break. And then you see the grating at a slightly different angle. You have to say whether it's um, being twisted uh, clockwise uh, or anti-clockwise. And then it's a typical psychophysical procedure. You're familiar with these sorts of things where you sort of uh, see whether where, where they make a mistake and bring, it, bring the uh, number of degrees down slightly. And you can measure an orientation discrimination threshold visually uh, for each, uh, each individual subject. There's a degree of variability in that, and the degree of variability in your performance on these tasks uh, relates um, to your uh, gamma frequency. Uh, if you measure gamma frequency with EEG in a more simple paradigm, where you just show uh, a visual stimulus. So your uh, gamma frequency uh, is related to neuronal inhibition, and your neuronal inhibition might be related to cognition. Uh, and we can see that in something like the visual system. Uh, the tuning of the inhibitory into neurons uh, allows you to have a greater uh, perceptual uh, focus and uh, perception of these uh, orientations of uh, gratings. So <clears throat> you've got uh, gamma uh, changing with age. Uh, gamma is related to uh, neuronal uh, inhibition and uh, your neuronal inhibition is related to some aspects of your cognitive performance, which may be the reason that some aspects of your cognitive performance might be changing in both healthy uh, and unhealthy uh, ageing. How can we uh, change uh, gamma waves and therefore possibly ameliorate uh, the changes that are occurring uh, with age? Uh, well, one way we try to do this in our department was with transcranial uh, direct current stimulation, which is a neuromodulatory uh, uh, technique. It's basically like a Kins machine, if you come across those, where you can put a current across the muscles to soothe your uh, bad uh, back. Uh, and so essentially you just have two electrodes that are connected to a, a nine volt uh, battery uh, with this uh, machine. 
he can put uh, a reference electrode somewhere like on the his cheek or uh, an adjacent brain region, and put an active electrode over the brain region of interest, uh, in this case, the uh, primary visual cortex, uh, and you can change the polarity of the current uh, that you give to the subject and either boost or uh, decrease uh, the amount of inhibition and excitation uh, in the uh, brain. Uh, so we did a study where we gave uh, transcranial direct current stimulation and measured uh, the gamma frequency before and after this neuromodulatory technique. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see uh, much evidence for changes in the gamma frequency uh, before and after the neuromodulation uh, allegedly induced by transcranial direct current stimulation. So it looked like this transcranial direct current stimulation is quite a promising uh, technique uh, for shifting inhibition and excitation balance in the brain. But the turn out, it turned out lots of the findings with it are uh, quite equivocal. And we weren't able to demonstrate an effect even with this sort of basic uh, measurement of uh, gamma frequency, which should be related to the uh, inhibition and excitation balance uh, that it's uh, trying to uh, shift. How can we change gamma oscillations or uh, stop their possible uh, decline? It's not all doom and uh, gloom, just because the TDCS uh, didn't show much of an effect. Uh, there's lots of uh, there's an unpublished report. Uh, I found that dark chocolate can boost the, both the uh, frequency and the power of your gamma oscillations. Uh, mindfulness and meditation uh, can improve your uh, 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 gamma oscillations. And possibly one of the most um, promising uh, avenues is if you give an auditory uh, stimulus or a visual stimulus and you deliberately click of it uh, at the same uh, frequency as your uh, own gamma oscillations, and that can give them a, a boost and then even ameliorate the changes you see in sort of Alzheimer's models. One thing we might be interested in in the Sports and Physical Activity Research Centre is the effects of exercise. Unfortunately, the findings seem to be quite uh, equivocal uh, there. So pre and post exercise, you can see some changes in gamma and during intensity exercises, some studies uh, show increases in gamma uh, and some uh, studies uh, don't. So uh, there's lots of interesting things there surrounding uh, gamma oscillations changing with age. This could underlie some of the changes in cognition uh, and there's some factors there we might be able to use uh, to ameliorate the changes we see with age. I'd just like to uh, <coughs> thank uh, previous PhD students who were involved in the collection of the data uh, I'll display, uh, particularly uh, Abdullah, uh, who's now uh, a lecturer uh, back in uh, Saudi Arabia and um, Abigail Dickinson, uh, who did all the original work with the EEG and the visual uh, discrimination paradigm, uh, who's now at uh, UCLA. So uh, thanks uh, for the invite again, and I'll hand over to uh, Manners. Thank you, Miles, for your uh, very, very uh, good uh, and informative presentation. Uh, I just want to wait for the discussion and questions after Mahna's presentation. So, hello, everybody. <clears throat> so, I'm also working on, uh, you know, how we can improve cognitive and physical performance uh, when we are aging. Uh, but my background is more engineering, so I'm working on how we can generate some neurotechnology to address these challenges. Um, so I'm directing Brain Computer Interface Lab at University of Sheffield. Our vision is to improve and augment human cognitive and physical performance. And we do research, as you see, with different technologies. We work with exoskeleton, physiological signals, VR, and also we work on uh, with brain signals. Uh, I mentioned about brain computer interface, but you would wonder what is brain computer interface. Here, you can see that um, a lady is playing a game on the computer, just using her brain signals. So this brain computer interface is directly communicating with the external device only using our thought. So this technology, BCI or brain computer interface can have a, a lot of potentials, but here, let me show you what component it has. 
So first of all, we need to record brain signals while the person is performing some sorts of mental tasks. So for example, the person may imagine movement of their right hand, or they may imagine movement of their left hand. So we record these brain signals, especially if we record brain signals non-invasive using EEG, it, it is very noisy. So we need to apply some signal processing algorithm, some filtering to reduce the noise, and thereafter extract the patterns in the brain that are related to imagination of movement of our hands. Yeah. And thereafter here, we have a model that our model can detect based on those patterns in the brain, those waves that we extracted, similar to what uh, Dr. Jones mentioned, for example, the gamma frequency, the, 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 the model is going to detect what type of mental task has been performed. For example, whether or not the person performed right-hand motor imagery or left-hand motor imagery. The output of this model can be used to control a device. It can be a controlling a prosthetic hand, it can be controlling a robot, or it can be controlling, for example, a cursor or a game on the screen of the computer. The interesting thing about this system is that the user can observe if their mental task has been identified by the system, by the machine, correctly or not. So the system can say, oh, okay, this time I imagined right hand movement, but it didn't work. Last time I had a better focus. I imagined, for example, um, kinematic movement, so it worked better. Let me do next time the same. So the user learn how to generate brain activities that are easier for the machine to detect. But also when we collect more and more data, our AI machine, this is an AI machine learning algorithm. So our AI machine can adjust the parameters to improve the performance. So the interesting about the system that is a mutual learning system, human learns and machine learns and they are learning together. So as I mentioned, it can have many applications. I, when we imagine movement of our the classical form of DCI is motor imagery based DCI. When we imagine movement of our right hand, the left side of motor cortex gets activated. It's exactly the same place that we, when we really move our hand. Uh, when we imagine movement of left hand, the right side of motor cortex gets activated. When we imagine movement of our feet, the center of motor cortex gets activated. When we imagine movement of our tongues, the temporal part of motor cortex gets activated. And these regions are separate enough that can be detected using EEG. So we can use these four commands to control an assistive device. We can use four, these four commands to control our wheelchair. Turn right, turn left. Foot motor imagery means go straight. Tongue motor imagery means Stop. Yeah. So this is how it can be used. So of uh, course, Dr. Is... Arbonis, sorry, can just be very close to the PC because your voice okay. is just. <laughs> I do my best. There is, thank uh, you. I apologize. So this is one of the one sorts of application uh, that uh, so this technology can be used as an assistive device, especially for those who are severely disabled. But uh, you know, something that we are very interested is using this technology for rehabilitation. People, our elderly, when we age, uh, we need to improve our functionality. There might be the risk of a stroke and uh, motor neuron disease, brain injuries will be increased. So the chance of having some sort of motor impairment would be increased. Every five minutes, we have one stroke in, in the UK. So perhaps we can use such technology for a stroke rehabilitation. So the idea behind this is that, for example, uh, when we, um, there are different types of rehabilitation methods that NHS provides. One of them that Sheffield Teaching Hospital provides is functional electrical stimulator. You put some electrodes on the impaired hand. These electrodes generate electrical activities 
very, very tiny electrical activities, but strong enough to open and close the hand. So they put the electrodes on the impaired hand and they make the hand open and close. It's a really you know, easy rehabilitation. They can do it at home uh, and it makes the muscles strong. It reduces the spasm. So it's really good, but it doesn't have anything with brain. There are also very complex, expensive robotic uh, devices that can move the hand, the impaired hand in different directions. Really good, but it's still, uh, uh, all the focus is on muscles. It's not linked with the brain. So we believe we can use this technology to link the brain with the muscle movement. So what we said is that uh, you can see here in the lab. So we ask the person to imagine or try to move the impaired hand. If they can generate a strong enough brain activities, functional electrical stimulator open and close the hand. Yeah. So this can be, yeah. So you see that the functional electrical stimulator opens and close the hand. So the idea is that when we link the brain signals in the, with the muscle movements, it can enhance the motor learning. It, it can enhance the neuroplasticity. So it can be functional electrical stimulator with brain signals, or it can be brain signals with robotic movements. Yeah? So we did this study, and we conducted um, this study with the stroke patients, chronic stroke patients, those patients who had a stroke many years ago, some of them 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And usually after six months, NHS doesn't provide any rehabilitation because it is believed that there wouldn't be any further improvement. But we, we, um, we invited our patients to the lab. They, they received this rehabilitation and a lot of them, although they had a stroke 10, 12 years ago, they had clinically meaningful improvement in their hands. So it shows the power of if we can link our brain signals and we can see direct feedback based on our brain signals, how it can enhance the outcome of rehabilitation. Um, okay, so this, um, this technology that we explained here, linking the brain signals with the uh, muscle movement. So it's, it's for, we, we tested on the stroke patients because it's a stable condition, but it can, be, it can be applied as a rehabilitation for anybody who has motor neuron disease, any neurodegenerative uh, diseases. And also interestingly, we recently realized that it can be used uh, as a training methods in a sport. So uh, very interestingly, uh, assume that um, when uh, some elites in a sport, they have some sort of injury, not only they can use this for rehabilitation, but they can do for do mental, they can use this technique for mental imaginary of the different practices that they can do. So they don't lose does uh, they mind about how to do different you know, actions while they are making sure that they are not going to injure or cause any further injury. So this is an, a venue that we are very interested to explore also to see how potentially we can use this technology for sports. So this technology, I talked about um, using this technology for improving physical performance, but also we can use this technology, we can use our brain signals to um, monitor our cognitive performance, monitor our uh, mood and mental state. So we develop machine learning algorithms in the lab so we can track those markers that mice, Dr. Jones, can de they detect in their lab. So we try to use machine learning algorithm that we can detect these changes in, re in almost real time. So assume we can detect these changes. So there it can have a lot of applications. Assume, for example, if we can detect attention using brain signals, so we can, if we see a driver is falling asleep or they are getting distracted, we can provide some sort of alarm. 
to these people. So they, they make sure that they stay in a good level of attention. But also we can use it for enhancing cognitive performance. And this is something that when we age, we know our cognitive performance starts diminishing. So such a technology can be like a gene, mind gene. So we can go to the gene, play some, some sorts of brain activities and make sure that we boost our cognitive performance. How is it? It is very similar, you know, neurofeedback training. You may have heard about neurofeedback training based on neuroscience studies that we know different markers are associated with different cognitive performance. So for example, parietal alpha is associated with attention. So we can um, monitor, we can record these brain signals and feed it back to this user in a game environment. So imagine if the user, usually when we have lower parietal alpha, which is frequency eight to 13 Hertz, means we have higher attention. So the ball goes up if the person can focus better. So we are hoping when they, when they train and they do get this game more and more, they learn how to focus, yeah? We can focus on gamma, for example, peak gamma, uh, that we had in the previous talk, we develop a game and we try to encourage the user, we give them some feedback, the, game, the ball goes up if they can enhance their gamma activity. And because the studies show that gamma is linked with better cognitive performance, so we, by playing this game, we are hoping that, okay, we make our brain fit, so hopefully we can maintain or enhance our cognitive performance while we are aging. But the problem is that, um, you know, if, if I tell you, improve your gamma, increase your gamma, you don't have any clue how to do that, yeah? It's a very uh, challenging task. So we try to use machine learning algorithms to try to find more individualized brain patterns. And based on that, we can uh, improve the performance of this neural the other way is that we can target the brain responses that spontaneously generated in our brain signal to the response of different, different stimuli. One of these, I don't know how much I have time, but one of these uh, brain patterns is P300. P300 is the response of, is a peak in our brain signal, is a response of our brain when we observe a target stimulus. So what does it mean? You are looking at different images on the screen of your computer. You are trying to find the image of your cat, for example. So the images, you look at the photos, no, 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 yes. Once you see the photo of the cat that you were looking for, around 300 milliseconds, after observing that, this peak happens in your brain signal. And the studies showed that this P300 is associated, the components of P300 is associated with our cognitive performance. So when we have a better attention, P300 is larger and it, it has a shorter latency. When we age, P300 starts getting shorter. One of the early signs of dementia is P300 getting short and short. So we developed a game that targets P300, yeah? Similar to presenting different images on the screen, this time we, we present different letters on the screen. And we ask the user to spell something by only focusing on the letters that you would like to spell. So different letters are presented on the screen. Imagine you want to spell the, the, the word high, so you focus on the letter of H. Anytime H presented on the screen, we ask silently count because it helps us to have a better attention, a stronger P300. Anytime H presented on the screen, we have a P300, a peak in our brain. Our model, our machine learning algorithm, detects this and detects which letter we wanted to spell. Next time for the next letter, adaptively, the game gets a little bit harder. Means we require to generate a stronger P300 in order to be able to detect, to spell the, the letter. 
So this time I need to focus more on the, on the letter that I would like to spell in order to be able to spell it correctly. So by playing this game, interestingly, we observed, we just recruited the students in our university. They came, they did some cognitive tests first, and thereafter for half an hour, they played this spelling game. And interestingly, we observed those who played this game compared to those that they didn't do this game, they, they had significant improvement in their, in their cognitive performance, in their reaction time in another test. Yeah? And we also showed that they could significantly modulate their T300. So the next phase of this study is that we are moving this, this game for elderly. So they can play this game and they show that they can enhance. The, first of all, they can make their P P300 stronger. So it means that the risk of dementia gets less and less, but also we can show that um, in a, in, they can see the, uh, you know, the results in, in uh, cognitive tests. So they show that they have improvement in cognitive tests. So this is a test that we are trying to modify, but the concept is the same for elderly, for those who are at risk of you know, mild, those with mild cognitive impairment. And uh, we are hoping if playing these games in long term can Made, enhance their cognitive performance and reduce their, the rate of cognitive decline. So these are the source of technology, brain computer inter interface that we can use uh, for enhancing physical cognitive performance. Uh, but as you will see, it's a very multidisciplinary research. It requires engineers, game developers, psychologists, neuroscientists, they work together um, to make sure that we come up with a technology that can be useful for people. Current studies are usually in the scale of proof of concept. So we need long-term data, we need long-term studies, bigger size studies uh, with higher sample size. And also we are, if we, we want to have this technology out of the lab, we need to be able to use easy to use EEG electrodes, those that are commercially available rather than the clinical uh, EEG headsets that have 60 channels, it's really bulky and full of wires. So thank you so much uh, for your attention and I thank for my team and the funders. Um, yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you Dr. Albone. So I don't know, Temis, can you uh, manage the the your class for the any questions from the audience for both Miles and Mahnos? Any questions? And, and also the, the capability of banking and the view of feedback. And how do you run now to the world with this whole grant? It's more than understanding of the Second question Do you want this will increase inequality and the access to this in the future? Because the rich people, they make a lot of money to get brain trained, to be smarter, to be more efficient, hopefully, uh, and hopefully something to be mindful. Uh, thank you. That's a very, very interesting question. I don't know if um, no, we didn't. We didn't so I can repeat yeah. it. Can you uh, repeat it, please? Well, what was the question? The question had two folds. The first fold is what would happen if the technology goes wrong? So what are the issues? And the second one was that what are, what would be the ethical aspect of the technology? Because richer people may have access if this technology augment their performance and gets you know better and people um, would not there might be some people that uh, get disadvantaged because they don't have access to this technology so um, about the first one what would happen if the technology goes wrong okay um, I was talking about something like neurofeedback to, to modulate brain signals that are associated with better cognitive performance. We can have some games to make it on the other direction, yeah? Instead of 
uh, suppressing our alpha rhythm, we can enhance our alpha rhythm or something like this. So there is a type of ethical issues to, that needs to be considered to make sure that the, all these sorts of experiments are ethically designed and they do what they are expected to do. So I, I assume there are similar regulatory approval for other medical devices. So they need to make sure that what they claim, they achieve it, and they need to also clearly mention what would be the side effects, okay? So to me, it's similar to the other. It's a bit scarier for us because brain is very unknown, but um, the regulatory approvals that we have for other medical devices should be able to protect if this technology goes outside of them. The other one is about inequality. Uh, that this technology might bring. And I would like to tell you that sadly, inequality does already exist in neuroscience. How, for example, um, a lot of EEG devices, we have a very challenge to record signals for those who have very thick curly hair. So usually these people are excluded from our experiments and we write it down in our paper that the data was not usable, rather than saying that the technology, the EEG device was not devised, was not designed properly, so people who have African style hair can use this technology. And in terms of engineering part and design part, to be honest, it's not a huge challenge, it's just the, the society and their community need to think about accessibility and inclusivity of the technology. But thankfully, recently there are some, um, you know, some uh, awareness about, okay, how to, how to make sure that our results are less biased, how to make sure that we report all these challenges, to make sure that if we come up with a medical device that our healthcare wants to use for NHS, we cannot ask our patients, okay, if you want to use this rehabilitation, you need to um, shave your hair, yeah? This, this is not feasible. Or people who are covering their hair and they would like to wear a scarf, so they need to, we need to make sure that the environment is ready for them so they can attend these studies. Yes, sorry. Yes, yes, exactly. I have one last. You guys mentioned that people with different brain types have different abilities to detect changes in visual stimuli. I'm wondering whether there's any sort of pattern here, for example, elite athletes and coordination skills and their ability to detect movement changes. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. So the um, question was that. Um, in my talk, I mentioned that the frequency of the gamma oscillation rings that is um, uh, associated with visual orientation uh, discrimination. And the question was, um, is there anything research uh, related to um, sports uh, performance? And um, interestingly, we're doing some research on that uh, uh, this morning. <clears throat> and I'm actually I'm talking about it. In the, I'm talking about sports anticipation in the management schools model. And then we're talking about aging in the sports department uh, today. So um, well, the, the short answer is yes. Um, and so um, we're doing a study at the moment um, that followed on some, some previous work in the department where um, we're look, looking at anticipation uh, in sports uh, performance. So um, anticipation is, is key to a lot of sports, as you can imagine. And one, of, one we're looking at is tennis. Uh, and um, in um, uh, in tennis, you can um, if you're looking at interest in anticipation in a wide range of domains like driving or uh, sports, you can do the paradigm is what called an occlusion paradigm, where you you show the start of something and then then it stops, so it's, so it's technically occluded. Then you've got to say what happens next, and so you're anticipating the change. So in, in driving, that can be quite complicated. In tennis, you you, you feel someone. Uh, taking a tennis shot and then it stops and then the participant has to say uh, would the ball be going left or, or right so it's a forced choice paradigm 
uh, and then uh, ex experts, um, novices who might do the school about chance, and then um, in some studies, experts get it right about about 60, 70 percent accuracy on a on a paradigm like that, depending on how you the precise details of how you um, make it. But then to finally get to your question, you can if you if you if you, you can. Um, uh, measure EEG changes while someone's doing that occlusion uh, paradigm. So in the uh, motor system that uh, Manners was uh, talking about with the um, uh, movement, do you also see changes in the motor and, and pre-motor cause? So you watch uh, movements similar to the sort of uh, uh, mirror neuron idea. So you see um, uh, desynchronizations, activations of the um, uh, of particular EEG rhythms in the motor cortex when uh, you view these um, anticipatory occlusion paradigms. And um, it's not a complex uh, finding. The experts, <coughs> the experts uh, uh, have a much uh, uh, faster and stronger uh, response in their motor cortex when they're watching this, um, um, this occlusion paradigm. So you sort of... Um, you sort of measure the EEG not when they're making the decision, but when they're watching this this pre the sort of pre video that gets occluded. So the, so the time zero to, to sort of sync off will be like when the video starts, and then when they're watching this video, their motor rhythms will will um, you know become activated in the motor cortex, and it's um, it's a bit faster, but it's, but it's much more much stronger and, and robust when the experts. Tennis players watch these videos, and if um, you know, uh, 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 in, in you know, some if you don't play tennis, it's sort of like you respond to sort of in the noise, and uh, if, you, if you play a bit, you can see a bit of bit of a response in the in, in the um, uh, the easier ones. And um, so, so that's the uh, the major one that I'm I'm aware of. But there's lots of um, um, th th things that um, you also mentioned there, like attention, general attention, and um, I'm not entirely sure the literature on this, but I think I think there's there's, there's some about um, um, some sort of like the theta wave when you when you're in more relaxed uh, relaxed state, but so something where you might get the get the yips like um, putting or something. I think I think I think there's um, um, you know the, the experts have got them you know in, in a much more sort of calmer, attentive uh, general state than than. Than, 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 you know, I'm not an expert, might be. Awesome. His, his hand. All right. Yeah, Max, my question is uh, some many people do exercise outdoor in yeah. the green area and uh, there are some published studies regarding the how alpha and beta wave changing because of the environment. Oh, yeah. So can we have a kind of the intervention for older adults to use this park run or outdoor environment or exercises in order to change or delay the decline in the gamma wave you said about dementia or other uh, cognitive functions. Could be like an intervention to just see how brain respond to this actually natural environment to a slightly mediate the decline because of the age, aging, but um, yeah, that's a, certainly a, a possibility. That might be something to explore. Um, so it's quite when I did, I did a little uh, literature review to make the the final slide, I was quite quite surprised um, uh, that there wasn't more more on it. So there were so some studies with sort of a acute exercise in younger people where it's sort of like before and after for an acute incident of exercise or uh, the brainwave changes um, during uh, exercise. I, I just gave the gamma results to fit in with the rest of the talk but there's um, you know, all the frequency bands uh, people have looked at. Uh, but there didn't seem to be much on um, sort of looking at the general healthy living or um, degree of exercise and um, and some of these changes. I know, I know there are other aspects of uh, brain function, particularly the sort of cerebrovascular components, that's obviously more uh, easy to link theoretically to your, your general cardiovascular thickness and, and the degree of exercise. Um, but yeah, there's lots of uh, scope to look at some of these, uh, these metrics and how they might um, um, be improved with um, 
you know, ex, you know naturalistic ex, exercising. And in terms of your comments about it being outside uh, and exercising, there's quite an interesting study we were talking about the other day. I think it was done in our job, it was done in the geography department, um, where people were, obviously it's well known that um, uh, exercise is beneficial to, uh, really beneficial to uh, mental health. And, um, and people sort of anecdotally report that exercising outside and felt running on the trail is, um, seems to make you feel even better. Uh, and um, the clinical side for which now were just like, oh, it's just the exercise, it's, it's just all through that. But then this is a very carefully controlled study in a geography department where they monitored people's exercise and where they were going. And they managed to control for everything and not being outside and the general green spaces gives you, give, gives you an extra boost uh, to mental health and above and beyond the, uh, the sort of more easy to explain physiological benefits of the, uh, of the exercise. So, so there could, could be could be uh, interesting things around uh, uh, those sorts of issues as well to uh, uh, to explore. Obviously, in Sheffield, we're very lucky that uh, we can all get out so on, onto the yeah. trial and yeah. fell every night. <laughs> yeah, uh, my follow-up question is for Mahnos. Is Mahnos available? I think they are related to both of you. So we have many conditions in sport with the sport uh, brain injuries, mm -hmm. and that is significantly affect decision making and mental health. So I don't know there is any kind of the intervention to monitor the brain changes because after brain injuries in a sport performers or by car accidents, they just monitor the brain changes and then recovery is happening by different uh, therapeutical, actually therapeutic methods. Do you think the computer science can facilitate the side effect of brain injuries and make the recovery faster by the um, intervention you discuss about a specific area of the brain by a stimulation and then connection with the computer? We have like these games to facilitate recovery process. So, um, so the, the idea behind, uh, for example, these sorts of brain computer interface is to keep giving feedback to the user that, okay, although you may not see any changes, you, you, you know, in physically, but you are changing your brain signals in the correct direction. So it helps people to keep the motivation to continue doing the uh, the performance, and it is the reason that it potentially can facilitate the, the rehabilitation. Um, but for example, we haven't started, but, but, but we had a discussion with um, one of our colleagues in uh, neurology department talking about those who have um, acquired brain injury, which is mostly because of the fall from bicycle or anything like this. So their frontal part of the brain gets um, affected and they might be okay in, in many tasks, but when they get back to their office, they, they cannot uh, inhibit the, the distractions. So for example, those that are working in open space, they feel it very difficult to continue working or those who are a type of uh, receptionist, if two, three people come together to ask them a question, they, they fail because they cannot, um, you know, uh, remove the distraction and focus on the specific part. And we are, we are um, in order to apply, so we need to understand which markers or which bio neuromarkers are affected that we have, thankfully, neuroscience, people like Miles working on this part, but we need to see how we can monitor them reliably in continuously in real time. But this is something that we are looking for to see if there are um, possibilities to have a type of attention-based brain training for people, for example, the, with the cognitive performance. But um, yeah, but yeah, this is a this is a very interdisciplinary area. So we need to talk with each other to learn from you. If you are you know expert in sports, telling us okay what you observe usually after some injury after fall, what so what what would be the case, and thereafter we can uh, you know, work together and try to see if there would be any any sort of potential solutions.
Correct, yeah. Thank you. It's best to. I mean, you, you address medical conditions in this, but I could not help imagining whether or not you could actually use this technology for training, for training. So, um, I mean, it, it sounds stupid, but it sounds like, it sounds like um, you could use the technology to an athlete who does not say train for tennis or for running. He will imagine doing yeah. that. You can see that his imagination is working. He does not move his body, yeah. then he's ready to go. Is that possible? So, uh, so um, not fully ready to go, but we are hoping it's better than not doing this one. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. To a certain degree, you may be injured or not injured, mm -hmm. and just by being idle mm -hmm. and imagining the activity, you actually train yourself in activity. Yeah, I think there was some evidence. I think there was, was some studies where you, you do motor imagery it gives people either you get a simple task what might be not as complex as a sport maybe a reaching and, and grasping task something, something like that and you get half the participants to do it and half the participants to do the motor imagery imagine and they both come out the same so i think you can train people with the motor imagery um, that's, that give you a similar outcome to uh, actually performing the motor action I thought I, I can't. I'm struggling to remember the actual studies which are, which are, which are coming to mind, but I think there definitely are studies of that nature. But I think they're quite simple, and it, it's in healthy control. It's not, you know, it's not for sort of like a neuro rehabilitation. That could be an outcome of it. But it's like it's like I think it, it's, it's a quite a simple motor learning thing, not not like you know. So, like, you know, uh, of course, with motor imagery, it's said uh, in the sport complex mm -hmm. scenarios, it's not, it's brain, the muscle, mm -hmm. strength, all of them need to work together. Mm -hmm. But um, imagine a person, athlete is off due to injury for one month, two months. And if they keep doing this imagination, by end of two months, when their muscle, when the body is now in a position that they can start um, doing exercise, they are in a better performance state compared to the person that didn't do any of these things in two months. So it helped them, you know, it's our hypothesis, to, uh, to, to maintain has it, that. Has it, has it been tested? There are a few studies, but mm -hmm. in a very small scale and um, in a type of proof of concept. But if that's true, then why? I mean, if I understood the representation, mm -hmm. um, the gamma, the gamma waves mm. may not be so effectively stimulated through sport. Yes, mm. that's not. We don't have strong evidence. Oh yeah, that yeah. Uh, just that's just general exercise rather than sport per se. That's just sort of looking at sort of sort of your fitness levels and the, and, the, and the exertion, the sort of cardiovascular as, as, aspects of it, rather than um, a complex sport. Uh, complex sport would do that. Would stimulate. Yeah, we well, yeah, we generate them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yesterday there was in the news um, paper. Yeah, uh, that um, I'm not sure if it referred to gamma waves, mm -hmm. but it referred to better cognitive performance mm -hmm. for people that do music. Oh yes. And do second language. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And that was familiar to me because I had seen the similar studies with electronic games. If you have yeah. an electronic game that changes the surroundings mm -hmm. quickly, mm -hmm. then the brain needs to adapt quickly, and that. Yeah. The cognitive performance. Mm. So, would that be the same logic behind sport improvement in the complex sport when it changes the, the background somehow that the brain operates? Um, yeah, well, they all, all, they all uh, st stimulate the brain and uh, and these high frequency uh, oscillations in terms of um, uh, cognitive decline. That there's, there's all sorts of environments, uh, enrichments, and uh, uh, and um, a key factor control for is, is the social aspects, uh, the um, social being part of a social group and not being isolated is um, a real boost to the brain. And so, um, there's people in our music department looking at music and uh, and Alzheimer's, and it's the sort of group aspect of it um, that they're particularly interested in. But there's always been the, the thinking of the, the, the cognitive um, endeavour of the music per se, also. Yeah.
give you a boost. Yeah, so I can add it. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is working on uh, bilingualism oh. and how it would affect the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, the study that they did, they have people who are knowing only one language, those who are bilingual, but from the childhood. Mm -hmm. And there is um, the third group that they are bilingual, but late by the, so they are, they mm -hmm. are learning the, third, the second language. And interestingly, they, they found that the third group is much faster in inhibiting switching between the tasks, because this is something that is, the brain is performing. Um, when you start learning a um, second language and you try speaking, it's, it's a very hard job for the brain because you need to inhibit, you need to shut down your mother language and try to find the words from another language. When you are a very early bilingual, it might be easier to switch, but for late lingualism, it's more difficult. But it's like a very great exercise for the brain, mm -hmm. trying to shut down the, the thing that the, the, the words that are coming from your native language, you're trying and trying to remember the ones that you recently learned and try to use it. And um, so they are doing this study and see what would be the long-term effect in terms of there are even stats showing that there are less dementia in these groups bilingual compared to those that have one language. Language, I assume, assume this is also very yeah. complex in yeah. terms of brain activities. So it's, it's um, you know, it could be something similar. Okay. Yeah. Anything more? Any question from online audience? And... No, okay. Uh, any question in the class? So I, I don't know because uh, that's it. Let me see. If, if not, we can wrap up the session if there is no any further question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both of you. Yeah, thank you everyone for your time and. Uh, Thanks, Temis, to facilitate this session for me, please. Thank you. Thank you.